is there a common thread to your offensive lulls from the last three games? And how much room is there for the offense to grow? Yeah, we can get better. We're looking at everything we possibly can do to get better. We're 1-0 and um, this past week, um, and we got to be more consistent. Where would you like to be more consistent offensively? Yeah, I, I think uh, consistency is is about everything. It's about it's about you know our run game. It's about our protection. It's about um, you know hitting the throws that we should hit consistently. Um, you know, it's it's all of it. It's it's third down. Uh, we've missed some opportunities. It's it's explosive plays. You know, but we played a defense this past past week. That's who they are. You know, if you look over the last, I don't know how many years, that, that that's who they are. It's it's big plays against them, uh, and if you're able to hit your big plays, you're going to have success. I think you know, in the years that I look at them, I, I think Wisconsin's really the only team that's been able to line up and consistently, you know, run the ball and 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 have success. You know, there hasn't really been too many people that've been able to do that over the last number of years. Um, you know, even the Ohio State game was a bunch of big plays. You know, it was a bunch of big plays. Your receivers, beyond KJ and um, Dotson, you haven't had a whole lot of production and catches, at least from any of the other guys so far. Is that why? Is that is that is that a problem at all or not? Well, I, I think part of it is is you know we're rotating two guys at that one position, um, you know, and and part of it is like I like I mentioned before when one of those guys has missed you know two games, um, but again it's you know it's it's the opportunities that present themselves and you know when a team is a press team at the line of scrimmage and going to take some of the the free access throws away, um, you know that's going to create some different type of opportunities you know in our slots and with our tight ends and things like that so there's going to be weeks where those guys have a bunch of production there's going to be weeks where where they don't just depending on what the, the defense does obviously in a perfect world we would love to have everybody involved um, but again you know the most important thing for us is we want to be one and oh at the end of the week which which we were this past week James we've asked you a lot of questions over the weeks about Noah Kane and his usage, your answer has pretty much always been consistent that you have four backs that you like. I'm just curious, is, is there something that we're missing? Are we not asking the questions the right way? Because we all keep wondering, well, you use Noah in these in-game situations and he's been effective, but then he only has five carries. So I'm just curious, is there – what is it that we're not seeing? Why is there a disconnect that we keep asking why he's not getting more usage, but we're not really getting you know any more information? First of all, I want to say thank you. I think that's a very fair question, and I appreciate how how you uh, uh, how you asked it. Um, yeah, there's always things that you guys are, are missing, and that's no disrespect to you guys, but um, we're, we're out at practice and in meetings for 16 plus hours a, a day and um, out at practice and watching everything, and you guys get 20 minutes a week to watch practice and then just the games. Uh, there's a, a thousand points that go into decision making. Um, but we got four backs that we really like. And uh, we'll continue to play those guys. Um, we're very pleased with Noah. Um, actually had dinner with Noah last night. Um, my wife uh, was busting his chops. Uh, he's been he's been great. You know, um, he's been he's been really good. We're, we're as pleased with him as you guys um, are, and we're as pleased with him as as the. Uh, as the fans are as well, but we're but we're also have a lot of confidence in those three other guys as well. So um, I get it. I, I get the question. Um, I think there's a lot of ways that you guys see us with young players, uh, a lot like Micah Parsons, who never started a game last year. Um, obviously, the difference is, is is Micah, you know, played starter reps, um, but we didn't have four guys at that position. So um, you know, we're one and zero. Oh. Uh, we got, you know, we found a way to get a win last week against one of the more talented rosters in in the country. Um, you know, against a, a really good football program, and um, Noah had a big part in that, and we'll continue.
to have a big part in that. I think you're, you're going to see his role grow as the season goes on, or you're going to see another back, um, you know, take some steps as well. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Earlier today, uh, your official Twitter account put out something about being on the Joe Moore Award uh, midseason honor roll, most outstanding offensive line group. Rasheed Walker pretty quickly quote tweeted that and said, uh, the culture has changed in the offensive line room. Is that something that's identifiable to you? Are there characteristics or traits about this 2019 version of your offensive line that have maybe distinguished it a bit in your six years here? Yeah, you know, um, yeah, I think obviously, you know, we've, we've made great progress there. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, Matt's done a really good job, especially in the off season and, and going visiting people and having people come in and visit us. Um, I think it's, it's the maturity that we have at the position. I think it's the talent that we have at the position. I think it's the depth that we have at the position. Um, I think it's a combination of all those things. I think Kevin Reiner, um, as a son of a letterman and, and as a former player, as a graduate transfer here, um, has brought value. I think Tyler Bowen, who's been an offensive lineman at this level as well as a offensive line coach at this level and in this conference, um, I think that's helped as well. Um, like, like, like you guys hear me answer a lot, it's, it's not really one thing. I think it's a combination of all of it. Um, and I think it's also, like I said before, it's, it's Gonzo and, and Mennett and Fry's leading the group um, and, and taking a lot of pride in, in who and what they're going to be. We still got work to do, but uh, you know, whenever you're recognized as, as part of a group that uh, is in consideration for the number one um, offensive line in all of college football, you know, obviously that's a good group to be a part of. But you know, for us, uh, you know, we wanna we wanna put our team in the best position to to win games and be one and zero each week. Um, but we also we also you know it'd be really cool, it'd be a heck of a statement to be able to win that award. You know, and I know that's a goal that that me and and Coach uh, Lime Grover have been talking about. You know, for six years. When you go into a game and know there's going to be four or five, six drives that you're not going to score, are there benchmarks for that drive becoming successful either over the time of possession that you had the ball? Maybe you're able to move it 30 yards, but then you have to punt anyway. What kind of, how can you mark success in those small failures? Yeah, you're talking about on, on offense. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good question. You know, um, obviously we want to score every drive. And, and, and trust me, I know the fans want us to score every drive, and I know you guys also um, communicate that as well. Um, but I do think your point is a good one with the style of defense that we're playing right now. Um, it, it's, a, it's a win um, if the play ends with a kick is something that I've always talked about um, in my 24 years of doing this as an offensive coordinator, you want to be kicking an extra point after a touchdown. You want to be kicking a field goal for points. Or you want to be punting. Because if you don't turn the ball over, which is one of the better things that we're doing right now and one of the better things we've done all year long with the style of defense we're playing, we still have a chance to win the game, which is the ultimate you know, prize. Um, I think the next step, obviously, that I think we're also doing a really good job on is being able to punt people back deep into their own terri uh, into their own um, end zone and into their own uh, end of the field. So it's not just kick a PAT, kick a field goal, or punt. It's being able to swing field position. So say we did start the ball on our own 10 and we're able to drive that thing out. Most people say if you're in a backed up situation, if you can get two first downs and punt and swing field position, you've won that that area, you know, that 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 situation of, of football. Um, no different than when our defense has people backed up. You know, you want to keep that field position. So we've we've had a number of punts where I think uh, Blake's done a really good job of pinning people inside the ten yard line, which the field position has been a big part of our success this year as well. And it's also skewed some of our punting numbers and punting ranking because we're moving the ball. You know, and when we do punt it, a lot of the times it's a sky punt situation rather than a traditional punt. So, yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, you want to score 50 points a game. But 
there is definitely uh, wins when you can when you can at the very worst punt people deep into their own territory. Uh, James, you mentioned Micah Parsons a little bit earlier. Is there anything he can do on the field anymore that that would surprise you? And you mentioned his high ceiling. Just how high is that ceiling for Micah? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know about that, um, but I just know it, Micah has gotten a lot better fundamentally, you know, from this time last year. Um, but he's still making a lot of plays just on athleticism and and instincts. And I think as his fundamentals and technique continue to improve um, and his understanding of the game at that position, which is still fairly new to him, um, it, it's hard to say where he can go as he continues to mature. Um, it's all of it, you know. So it, it's hard to say because literally – I don't think he's anywhere close. I don't think he's anywhere close um, to to his ceiling. I don't, I don't think he's. I don't think he's anywhere close. And and I don't want that to come off the wrong way because um, I think he's you know one of the better players in in college football. But um, this is all still very new to him, and um, he's embraced the, the the techniques and the fundamentals and things like that of the position. Um, but I think he can be even better there. Antonio Shelton seems to be one of the most vocal guys on the defensive side. When did you see that trait in him kind of develop, and how have you seen him grow as a leader both on and off the field? You know, uh, he's he's really been really been good. I think all the way back to when we first got involved with Antonio, I remember meeting him and his mom um, at a Buffalo Wild Wings in Columbus, Ohio, I think is where it was. And uh, that was kind of our, our home visit with him and, and kind of went through everything and got on him late and we're, we're able to get him here. And uh, he's a smart guy. He's a very strong guy, powerful. Um, and he just continues to work, you know, and, and his improvement from the time he got here to now is, is significant. It's interesting, though, that you, you brought that up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to branch off because it just it made me think of, of something else when you asked that question. Um, and these things aren't really connected. But, uh, you know, Tom Bahali, it was the first time that, that we got to spend some time around him this weekend. He'd been around, but this was the first time we spent a significant amount of time, and he spoke to the team, and I got to spend a bunch of time with him. And... and um, you know, being our honorary captain and, and his children, which I offered them all, even a three-month-old. Um, but Tamba's humility was one of the most impressive things I've ever been around. I, you know, you, you introduce him to the team and you put all of his accolades and his resume is as impressive as anyone. And... He got up and talked to the team. And some guys get up and talk to the team, and they wow the room because they're dynamic. He wowed me and wowed the room because of his humility. I mean, it was unbelievable. And really his message was, was to, um, to talk less and listen more. Um, and just the way he said it and the way he went about his business uh, was really, really impressive and, and left a huge uh, impression on me. And he still owns a place here in, in Happy Valley, so I'm hoping he'll come back more. Um, I think you guys have heard me talk about before. That was something I think over the last year and a half or maybe last three years we've made significant progress in is forever those guys could come back and it was family and there's been there was so much change in such a short period of time uh, that we lost some of that and I think we've made tremendous progress there the guys that have come back uh, that have given us a chance to get to know us and for us to get to know them it's been really good and Tomba was another great example of that so um I, I want him back as, as much as possible because I think he'd be just a tremendous mentor to our guys. And uh, you can see why this place was so successful for so long 
when you can get those type of people to join your family and join your program. 